Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us again on a new episode of Better Together. Today, we're joined by climate scientist, yes, yes uh, I'm Sophie Dalos, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about the what we've been seeing uh, with the lockdown and what's happening in the climate. We've all probably seen pictures on social media in that skies are looking a little bit clearer and we're like yay but what does this actually mean so we're gonna dive into that today and for those of you new to the platform on the right side that's where you can put in some comments and have a little bit of a conversation there if you have questions there's an ask a question below so just pop it in there if you accidentally put a question in the comment section we'll transfer that into the ask a question section all right, uh, welcome and thank, thank you, you for joining us. Um, yeah, if you could just tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and Cicero, where you work actually. So I'm a climate scientist and I work at Cicero. That's a center for international research in Norway. Mm -hmm. And uh, we work on a lot of different subjects uh, related to climate change. Mm -hmm. But uh, recently I've been working more on uh, land climate interactions. So for example, our future forest management in Norway could uh, impact the climate. So that's one of the projects we are working on. Yeah, amazing. Um, actually, so this might sound a little bit uh, <laughs> a little bit speculative. I just wanted to ask, kind of address the elephant in the room in a way. When we do see pictures that have been circulating, for example, around social media, that um, some of the some of the biggest polluted cities, like uh, skies, a little bit clearer. There's less smog. What actually? What does that actually mean, or what does it entail? Yeah, so uh, actually in Cicero, uh, we have several people who have been working on these questions. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is Glenn Plitter and uh, Robbie Andrew, who are part of the paper uh, recently published by Corinne Le Carré. And they have shown, for example, that uh, greenhouse gases, more specifically CO2, have been uh, decreasing during the different confinements. So for example, they say that a daily uh, CO2 emission have been decreasing until minus 17% per day. And at peaks, it was minus 26%. So that's actually quite something, uh, it's something quite important on a daily basis. Uh, that's one thing that we have seen. There is also another paper uh, by uh, someone from Nina, Zenter et al. Uh, 2020. Yes. And uh, they have shown that air pollution has actually decreased in a lot of uh, major cities in the world. And what's also interesting is that they have been showing that this decrease in air pollution has actually led to put a potential um, improvement in health. So for example, in uh, asthma for kids. Mm -hmm. So uh, like we have really seen like some um, quantitative effect of this confinement. Then if you, for example, the CO2 emission, if you put them on the yearly average, mm -hmm not as much uh, of a decrease. I, they say that it could be between minus four and minus seven percent, but that's still uh, something uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, and about this, I think it's also interesting to think that there are for me several sides of, uh, you know, COVID-19 and climate change. You have this side that is more physical of a concrete decrease in air pollution and CO2 emission, but you also have this very interesting side of uh, social science, you know, like we during this confinement we have <laughs> developed different habits uh -huh. and um, some of them are good for the climate and uh, i think what one big question now is actually are we keeping these habits or are we <laughs> you know changing and coming back to normal yeah. what it takes so for us to keep these habits that's uh, one of uh, yeah really important question we also have at Cicero with uh, the social scientists. Cool. And um, what kind of components really make up the air pollution, or would you say? So, for yeah, for the CO2 emission, for example, it's really interesting to see where this decrease in CO2 emission come from. And actually half of it come from surface tr transportation. So cars, uh, yeah, the, all these yeah, the, all the car <laughs> drive you can do, for example, that's part of this decrease uh, in uh, in CO2 emission. And again, what's also interesting now is coming back to this question of social science, we know, are, okay, are we able to continue in this decrease? Mm -hmm. And of course, it's difficult to keep that kind of decrease because now people have to come back to work. Yeah. Now, all of us can do home office and uh, also depending on your country, 
uh, home office is not as well accepted as other country. Uh, I come from France and I think home office was not something that we were doing as much as in Norway, for example. Yeah. But what's interesting is to see that if we want to have policies that have an impact on climate, certainly working on surface temp transportation could be something really interesting. So having more bike friendly uh, cities and uh, allowing home office more often, mm -hmm. for example, as certainly things that could work pretty well. Yeah. Um, so kind of some of these environmental factors, like for example, having, um, I didn't mean factors, kind of uh, environmental policies that work towards uh, having more eco-friendly and emission-friendly uh, modes of transportation. I think yeah, it's really cool because, I mean, actually something that I'm kind of thinking is that um, for example, in Oslo, there's been a really big movement for having Oslo as a car-free mm -hmm. uh, city. And then COVID-19 comes and hits. Um, do you think that kind of makes challenges that progress in a way? Because I, I don't know, because I'm sure some people are thinking like, well, the safest way for me to be isolated and transporting mm -hmm. myself is by using more cars. Do, so do you think this is hindering that progress a so, little bit? So, yeah, I, I don't know what will win, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, between the car and uh, bike and public transportation. Mm -hmm. But at least uh, what's interesting, for example, is that in different cities, uh, big cities in the world, in Brussels, Paris, Bogota, uh, they have increased uh, by a large number the uh, bike paths. Mm. So, for example, in Brussels, I think it's 40 kilometers of uh, roads and parking space that have been changed uh, into bike paths. And uh, I think, so, I mean, seeing something like that is quite encouraging. No, of course, you have this issue that people will use their car more, but hopefully, I, I don't know, I'm hoping that it won't last that much. Mm. And uh, so, I mean, you have al always this negative and positive effect, and I don't know which one will win, but it's so encouraging to see that some cities are uh, developing these bike paths and, uh, and other me measures that are quite important. And uh, one thing that can be a little bit less positive it's at this point, these bike paths are temporary. They are not supposed to, I mean, we are not sure if they will stay. It was just to help during the confinement and this particular situation. Mm -hmm. But the good thing is that uh, several social scientists or uh, professors have said that usually when you have this temporary measure, they last because they, you know, people like it and they use it. And so in the end, we keep this 40 kilometer of bike pass. So I'm, um, yeah, I'm really hopeful that actually these temporary measures will actually will be permanent because yeah, we are kind of this uh, green transition that is not permanent, but I'm, I'm hoping that we will keep some stuff permanent. Yeah, so kind of um, using this as a way of gaining momentum, I think, because um, yeah. um, something that you're saying, it's about um, habits and <laughs> it takes 30 days to build a habit. And once you kind of are used to the rhythm of something, then it feels a lot more natural or it doesn't feel as tasking to take it on. Um, after a while, because you're like, oh, I've, I've done this already, so I can do it. So, yes. so fingers crossed for that. Um, and are there um, other habits apart from transportation that you're seeing changing and kind of helping in kind of reducing the emissions? So, I mean, we have seen a lot of change in habits. Mm -hmm. um, some of them don't, I don't, don't really have uh, as much impact on emissions. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think we've seen people eating more local food, uh, more uh, organic food, for example. Um, this is, uh, I mean, really good for your health and for the local economy. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't have as uh, big of an impact on, on the climate. Uh, I think the biggest impact, for example, if you want to do something with food, you know, for the climate, it's really changing your diet. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily uh, becoming uh, vegan or vegetarian, but uh, you know, uh, eating more fruits and vegetables and a little bit less uh, meat and dairy mm. is something that has uh, an impact on the climate. And I don't know at this point if that's something that has been done in different countries, but uh, we really see that uh, people are being more aware and are more trying to do something for the climate. So at least if <laughs> someone wants to do something for the climate, changing a little bit their habit in terms of food is a really good uh, and yeah, important change. Yeah. Um just kind of 
using that kind of adopting a more local lifestyle uh, do you have kind of any tips uh, for Norway for example because uh, mm. so uh, I mean I don't it's not necessarily uh, climate related but mm. I think it has been seen that uh, during this um, confinement we have done much more uh, online shopping yeah. And uh, I mean, sometimes it's, it's good, but sometimes it's for big uh, industries uh, like uh, Amazon or stuff like that. And uh, it looks like sometimes when we do that, it's uh, rich people that get richer. And uh, while we are doing that, small businesses are struggling. So it's not really related to climate. It's more on a local e economy or a more solidarity point of view, yeah. uh, helping those small businesses by, I don't know, buying a coffee or, uh, I don't know, buying your fruits and vegetables to a small shop uh, is certainly uh, something that would help, you know, locally people around you. So, yeah, uh, at least that's something I'm thinking about currently. Yeah, I mean, because I think what we're learning from the pandemic, or at least it's being revealed in a bigger scale, is that uh, the economy, health and climate, they are, they have a point where they intersect that perhaps we would like or prefer to keep separate sometimes. But I, I do think that it, it is a valid point because the regressive nature of the pandemic as well it hits the people most vulnerable first and yes. it's kind of like how do we lift everyone up so we all come out uh, you know better in yeah, that yeah, yeah. Sense. definitively and mm. i think we're seeing this impact in the u.s so yeah. a lot uh, so yes no i, uh, I agree <laughs> and um actually i'm gonna bring this kind of in the you talked a little bit about home office and habits. Uh, what is, uh, can home office be a little piece of the puzzle in helping towards the climate challenge in that we, uh, we stay home and work from home or yeah. maybe we're using much more electricity? Mm -hmm. does, does that balance out or does it help? Uh, I, I think uh, home office would definitely be part of the solution. Uh, I mean, it also depends. It's, so always these good solutions, they also depend maybe on where you come from, where you live, because there are different ways of transportation and different options. But I think in general, doing home office, when you think about people who every day drive two hours per day, even, I mean, just not talking only about climate, but in general, not driving these two hours per day, uh, it's two hours where you can do something else. And I'm sure many people would know what to do with it. So it's also interesting to have these solutions where it's not only good for the climate, but you have co-benefits. So it's good for your health. It's good for, uh, you know, your family. It's good for you in actually in general and maybe for other people. So, um, yeah, I think home office is really a solution and it's good because it's not only good for climate, it's good for a lot of things at the same time. So, I mean, from my point of view, we should uh, encourage it. Yeah. Of course, we should maybe not be at home office every day because we need these interactions with people. I mean, I'm talking for research from my point of view. Um, Home office is good maybe three days a week or something like that, but you need this one or two days where you interact, where you raise all, the, all these questions with other people and uh, and you have this coffee, you know, where you have uh, this interaction. So it needs to be adapted. We cannot keep everything that we had during the confinement because it was really strict uh, yeah. in some countries at least. And um, But, you know, learning something from that and keeping part of it, I'm sure it's... Uh, interesting and uh, a good idea. Yeah, um, when you talk about kind of uh, these core kind of habits, is, is that what helps when you feel or when you see that it's benefiting you both ways? Do you think that that helps in terms of making us more likely to keep positive habits and kind of habits that reduce emissions on our part? I, I, I think this question of habits, so I've been talking with social scientists in, in Cicero to help me yeah. about uh, habits because it's a very complex question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of things that uh, go uh, in this question of keeping these habits. So, for example, it depends on how long you have to have these new habits. You know, if you only have it for a couple of days, you'll come back to normal. And that's normal, that's human, no? But if you have it for a long time, uh, and I think that's uh, what's happening now. Some of these habits are actually kept for quite a long time. Then you are more, uh, you know, it's 
more possible that you will keep it. It also depends on where they come from, uh, a shock, uh, you know, all this um, yeah, origin of your changes, uh, it's also quite important. So that's uh, also an important factor. So yeah, it, uh, it's difficult to know, you know, what, uh, what will stay. And I'm also thinking that some of them are easier than other. Like if you start buying local food, um, I mean, you're more likely to continue. Uh, not using your car is more complicated. So mm. yeah, I'm thinking that some of them are also easier to keep than others. Yeah. Um, and so, for example, we talked about, like I read uh, in a paper that uh, in Norway at least is an upsurge in people buying more. So we, at least in retail, in terms of that, do you think that um, this, because I'm kind of thinking of this in a before and after in a way, mm -hmm. because now we're seeing like, okay, the carbon emissions are going down, so we're creating a little bit more of a positive effect, uh, whereas in bef our levels now, we're kind of slowly going back to normal. Does this undermine progress or from a research point of view, is it undermining progress or is it more that, oh, well, things are just going back to the way they are and I, I think it's difficult. It, it, it's not, uh, yeah, yes or no at this mm. type of question. I think first it's a bit too early, because I mean, if you, if you look at some countries, let's say France. I mean, the lockdown has ended really recently, and they were still under different measures. Like you could not go uh, further than 100 kilometers uh, from your home. Uh, then now it's 300 kilometers, so you're still under restrictions, and uh, and maybe there is a little bit of compensation of what you have not been able to do during two months or something like that. But I think at this point, it's too early. And I mean, and I imagine that, of course, there will be people coming back to normal. But I also have a feeling, or maybe I'm a, I'm a bit naive or optimistic, but I, I, I mean, I really see a lot of people around me changing their habits. Mm -hmm. So it won't be everyone, but uh, it, it's a good progress. Like to this awareness uh, seems to be um, increasing. So. I, I, at least for me, that's still a progress. And, yeah. But I'm not naive, of course. Like the decrease in CO2 emissions we have seen this year, it should represent like four to seven percent decrease, you know, per year. Yeah. And that's what we would need to do every year yeah. to meet the 1.5 degree target. So, I mean, what we have done this year, I mean, we would not do it the same way next year, but we, we need this decrease, we need to continue. And uh, so I'm also... Yeah, objective. We, we yeah. If we only do that, that's not we will be really important. We need to continue uh, to do a real permanent green transition. Mm. And do you feel uh, hopeful? I mean, this is just kind of like a mm -hmm. question that's kind of up in there. Do you feel hopeful that perhaps we can do that? Uh, it depends on the day, sometimes. <laughs> um, I mean, that's uh, also why I'm a climate scientist. I think I'm, I'm hopeful. I mean, I, I believe we can do something. I am hoping we can do something. Mm -hmm. So, of course, it depends on the day. Sometimes you see that it's not going really the way you mm -hmm. want it to be. But uh, uh, I, I think we, we should try. I mean, the, it, it would, I mean, so many studies now are showing like all these um, really positive effect not only for climate but for a lot of uh, social like i mean for social injustice in general mm -hmm. if you yeah if you put all these things together and, and i mean the work will work would be bet better in some way so yes i think we need to try we really need to try to yeah do better yeah um this is, might be I'm not sure if it's a dumb question or not, but when you talk about the numbers, like the 47%, is that just basically what we've seen during the... No, it's a projection. So, okay. uh, so for example, the study I was talking about from Corinne Le Quere, at this point, they have done uh, so daily uh, measurement or estimation of uh, CO2 emissions and how they have decreased. But uh, then they do projections. So they look at, you know, uh, knowing what we know now, you know, that the lockdowns are uh, slowly ending and, uh, you know, what uh, what they think would happen over the year. And then they do an average uh, estimate uh, projection over the year. And they think that that's why it's between four and seven percent, because they think that in average for this year, mm. globally, it will be a decrease of four to seven percent. Mm. 
Okay. So it's an yeah, it's a projection. Yeah, and I think we have a few questions over here. Let's see. Um, so here Sigur is asking, what is the most promising uh, technology in the making that can help in tackling um, climate change? Do you think? <laughs> I, I don't know. Some, I mean, yeah, there are, I think there are technologies. I mean, there are, I don't know, some people say electrification um, of, you know, a lot of transportation. I don't always, <laughs> I don't think it's only one technology. For me, mm. uh, if we want to tackle climate change, it's about collaboration. Okay. So it's collaboration by all sectors, by people, by, uh, you know, government, like it, it's really a multi-level collaboration. Mm. So I don't know if I could say, uh, I mean, maybe someone with more expertise could say one technology, but I'm more thinking it's a collaboration uh, with, with everyone. We need to do, because it's not only one thing that will tackle climate change. It's because we will uh, change a little bit our diet. We will uh, use more our bike. Uh, some transportation will be electrified. Mm. Uh, you know, it's all these things together mm. that will help and contribute uh, to a, yeah, a better climate. Yeah, um, I actually had a little uh, question uh, about <laughs> that, actually. Um, has the pandemic, in a way, helped foster a little bit of collaboration or at least fostered a way to communicate with different sectors and how uh, you could collaborate move fo uh, moving forward and kind of like in a more serious way and with weight on it? So, I mean, I don't know from a policy point of view, I think I'm not the one who would say that, yeah. but uh, at least uh, in research, pure research, uh, for example, this paper uh, by, uh, I think, uh, yeah, by Nina uh, was done with a researcher from Cicero. Mm -hmm. So they, they worked on health. You know, it's a collaboration that I think we didn't really have before. Uh, we, we were working on health before, but it's just this new network of people uh, were created during uh, the you know the lockdown and yeah so I think it's definitely uh, bringing new questions and for <laughs> answering these questions usually you cannot only work on your own you need to work with other people and get their expertise and knowledge so uh, yeah I think it has created new new collaborations at least for us at Cicero yeah that's exciting and we just hop back into another mm -hmm. question over here um, so uh, Fad is asking, um, how are we using this opportunity to perhaps change oil industries such as the oil industry, fast fashion, uh, considering that the Norwegian government is now spending a lot of money to save them? Yeah, I think in Norway, that's a really central question. Mm. Yeah, there is really this um, two part where uh, um, uh, we do and uh, I think government make effort uh, for uh, a green you know, green country in some way, but yeah. we still have this oil and gas part that is really strong. Mm. Uh, I think it's a, I mean, yeah, it's a really difficult question. I I'm not sure I'm the best one to answer it, but but yes, that's something we need to address. And I'm, I'm, I'm of course not the first one to say that, but yeah, it's a very central question. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, uh, Clara is saying, uh, or is asking, during the lockdown, we've had, We've had to have meetings virtually. Do you think that this will continue after the lockdown to help with CO2 reduction? I hope so. I really hope so. Uh, I think in France, for example, there are companies that I decided to keep home office uh, for the whole company and not maybe not every day, but uh, really to put it as a rule, at least something where what you can do. And uh, I mean, I know that really that was not something that was available for a lot of people in France before. And not every company will be doing that. But I, I'm, I'm, I really think that a lot of companies have realized in France and in other countries that people are effective at home. They can work, they're efficient, they, you know, they can they can do it. So yeah, you need to find a balance, mm -hmm. uh, not only home office, but yes, I, I think some companies will keep it. And I think it's really good. Yeah. And um, um, I'm just saying, do you think that the rhetoric, since we're in a pandemic now, do you think that the rhetoric uh, about climate change is going to change because the pandemic feels immediate, it's here, it's going to mm -hmm. affect our bodies? Do you think that that's going to change the energy and the excitement that we all had in the beginning of the year towards being more climate friendly and reducing emissions in our carbon footprint? 
Yeah, I mean, that's a risk, of course, because I think now we are under, uh, or we were, or we are under stress. Yeah. So that triggered some, um, some change in habits and different things and some immediate so solutions. And uh, I think the big issue with climate change, because we know what we have to do. I mean, there is a lot of knowledge on the impacts on, I mean, even if, if we would know, would like to know more about certain things, but we know climate change is happening. We know there are impacts. We know things that would de definitely or definitely help, you know, decreasing greenhouse gases emissions. So, but not as much as what we want has happened yet. So, because it's not something that you touch or you see, or, you know, it's not like the pandemic where we had an immediate, like, stress over us. It's more something, you know, <laughs> around you in some way. So, yes, there is, of course, this risk that when the pandemic is gone, and, <laughs> and of course, I don't hope it will last, mm -hmm. uh, that we will come back to normal. And um, But I hope it won't be the case. I, I still really think that some people will keep uh, habit. But it's also the thing that it's not only individuals, government need to put also in place policies that facilitate um, a lot of, uh, yeah, climate measures. So, mm -hmm. it's yeah, it's all of us, really, at different levels. Yeah. Um, do you feel hopeful that perhaps uh, that may happen? I think um, there's like a green package going out, if I'm not mistaken, in Norway. Yes. So is that a little bit of a cause for optimism there? Yeah, it depends what, what's in what there, <laughs> because I think it's uh, easy to label something with green and then yeah. uh, you need to see what's in there. So I don't know exactly what's in there, so I, I, I don't know. But uh, um, I mean, yes, I'm, you know, I'm partially hopeful and, and sometimes pessimistic, it depends. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I would not do what I do if I didn't think we had a chance to, to do something and to get better. Yeah. And uh, let's see. And um, Amka is asking, are science, scientists using data from this period to show how we can combat climate change, to show solutions that, bef uh, that before have been seen as unrealistic? Yeah, I, I, so I think part of this is, for example, this study from Corinne Le Carré, uh, I mean, you really see this decrease in uh, CO2 emissions. And you see that half of it comes from surface transportation. So that's a clear signal that if you want to uh, implement a policy that has an impact on the climate uh, quickly, uh, something on surface transportation is clearly, you know, something that could work. So I think, yes, we are uh, looking at it from a more like um, quantitative and I don't know, yeah, not quantitative, but actually more uh, physical point of view. And then also from the point of view of social science, but uh, for social science question, I think some of them we will need to talk, do interviews and talk with people. So it might take a little bit more time, but um, yeah, we are actually getting a lot of insight uh, or some insight on what we could do for uh, tackling the issue of climate change, yeah. part of it at least. Mm. Um, just about, um surface transportation. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, how does aviation, for example, play a role in this? Is, is that considered in traffic transportation as well? No, so, so, so it's, that's why it's called surface transportation. Aviation is just another part of uh, the emissions. And actually, so if you look at the um, relative change, so in percentage, you know, of course, uh, airlines have been like, yeah, stopping a lot. I mean, mostly shut down. Mm. There was still some flight, but it's the biggest hit, I think. Uh, I don't remember the percentage, but it's a huge decrease. But then if you look in absolute values, uh, as they don't contribute as much to CO2 emissions, then it's not a big decrease in the absolute uh, decrease in emissions. So surface transportation, that's why it's like much bigger. I think surface transportation is 50%, uh, while aviation must be 3% or something oh. like that. So uh, yeah, it's it's not what was the biggest yeah, uh, contribution for the decrease in CO2 emissions. Yeah, um, actually, I'm just wondering um, what constitutes kind of local emissions or how do you, when we talk about emissions, for example, uh, in surface transportation, how does that actually relate to the, to the bigger picture in terms of, uh, in terms of the climate challenge as a whole? Um, yeah, it's, Surface transportation is, uh, I mean, it's actually, yeah, we know that it's a big issue. We know it's important for uh, climate. But uh, I was yeah talking with a social scientist in Cicero, and it's something uh, we have known for quite some time, but it's mm. difficult to change this habit. Like the car is really something that, 
we we are used to own our own car uh, we are used to use it uh, a lot so it's a very a really complicated issue but uh, yeah we've seen people some people using more their bikes so, so or other options so hopefully it will change but cars are really a complicated uh, and tricky yeah. question because i guess uh, in a way it's almost <laughs> taking a little bit of independence from people i think yeah, a car can be is quite a symbol of uh, independence and being able to go to places by yourself drive yourself somewhere and in some places it's absolutely necessary. yeah I, I guess it's i think it for me it's like uh, the question of food no we are not asking everyone to Well, I'm not asking anything, but at least we are not thinking that everyone uh, should be vegan or vegetarian, but it's about, you know, reducing your meat and dairy consumption. I think for cars, it's a little bit the same. Mm. Maybe uh, it's about also starting by reducing your use of car. I think in, in many studies, we have seen that we should, we do really short commutes in cars that could really be done. Um, walking or biking, for example. And uh, we know that it's actually much better for your health. Mm. Uh, you know, for health points of view, it is, it's, it's better if you walk a little bit more. So there are all these uh, solutions that I think we are able to do, but we also need governments to help us in this way. Like, yeah, you have, yeah cities where you can walk and you can bike easily. Mm. Uh, we have a few more questions. Um, re uh, so Teresa is saying that recently they launched the SpaceX rocket into space. Do you think this is a big threat for the climate? The <laughs> <laughs> good question. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, of course, I've heard about it. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, at this point, I uh, yeah, I, uh, I have no. Yeah, I, I don't know yet. Sorry. <laughs> that's that's completely fine. And um, Asi Good is asking, what is the most effective solution to lower carbon uh, in the air? Example: carbon capture by planting trees. Uh, yeah, I mean, it also depends on uh, what level you're looking at. Are you a country? Are you a region? Are you an individual? You know what? Uh, because we can all actually do something for uh, reducing the amount of uh, greenhouse gases, uh, or at least not maybe not reducing, but at least helping that it doesn't go up, mm -hmm. continue goes going up. So yeah, there are, um, there are different solutions. So carbon storage uh, is something that is still developing so of course trees is uh, it's a good option but it, it's so in the future we will have this question of what do we do with our land about land use conflicts because that's, that's a really central question because we are more people we need to eat we need energy uh, we need to store carbon so uh, this really comes back to the question of um, how can we use our land the most effectively so we can uh, do everything we need to do mm. and so it, it's it's difficult to answer what is the best for agriculture or what is the best for capturing co2 it's just it's more about uh, how do we combine everything and that's uh, actually a, a big area of uh, work now to see let's say norway for example because we don't have that much space to do agriculture so you know how do we combine uh, feeding people uh, having the climate goals that are uh, completed and uh, uh, yeah all, all these things need and the energy mm. so that's using land so it's, it's a big question what do we do with the land yeah because i mean i was just thinking as you said that about how the, there isn't as much arable land in norway and i was kind of wondering like mm, that's true because then how you kind of start thinking like okay how does this kind of affect our local uh lifestyle in that sense so i think it's a very fascinating <laughs> kind of intersection and i think that's probably what adds to the complexity of the climate challenge that there are so many angles uh, do, do you agree like um The fact that there are so many angles and there are so many considerations and there's, of course, the human component to it, that it makes it uh, difficult. I, I think that's why we, uh, I mean, we know that we need to work together. And when I say together, for example, is including a lot of different disciplines. Yeah. So that's why at Cicero, it's really nice to have this mix of uh, natural science, social science, and in social science, you have economists, you have, you know, all these different backgrounds. And I mean, we all have something to bring to yeah. answer the, que the different questions. Mm. So yeah, the, you, you need a lot of different expertise and collaboration in general. 
Yeah, and uh, we have a question from Marius. Uh, there's been a decrease in local air pollution as far as I understand during mm -hmm. this period. How are you as scientists going to use the data and information about that going forward? Uh, I, uh... Uh, I mean, you, you can use it in different ways. What I was saying before is that, for example, we can uh, see where this decrease comes from, surface transportation. So we've seen like for policies, that's a pretty effective way. Then you can use it also in different ways, like in more <laughs> physical question. What is the impact of this decrease? In CO2 emission, you have health impact. I'm pretty sure you must have more physical impact on clouds, on you know a lot of different things. So you can go from very theoretical questions to more uh, in, you know uh, applied questions. Mm. But uh, I, I think yeah, you, because it's like a real life experiment. That's something you would like to do, but uh, of course you can't normally. So uh, I mean, I'm sure this will lead to a lot of uh, interesting studies. Yeah. Well, thank you. I think we're actually kind of hitting our run. Thank you so much for being with us. I think this is, uh, it's super interesting and it's super insightful, at least for my part. I realized the more I read, the more I perhaps didn't know and the more I was surprised at the, the building complexity. So thank you and thank you for Cicero for working with this and making it thank slightly you. easier for us to understand. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Uh, if you have any more questions, please do check out Cicero's website. They have amazing blog posts about climate, climate change and what we're observing. So just have a read, maybe pop them some questions. I don't know if you yeah. have time for that and I'm sure they'd love to answer them. Thanks and hopefully you guys enjoyed your lunch. Thank See you, you next time. Bye.